We turn in our reading in the scriptures to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. In chapter 1, verse 19, 1, verse 19, the apostle is told, write the things which thou hast seen. He just saw a vision of Christ. And the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. In chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we have his writing the things that are in his letters to the seven churches. Then in chapter 4, we read this, first verse, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were, which was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Cometh hither, and I will show thee Things which must be hereafter. Things which must be hereafter. The rest of the fourth chapter is a vision of the throne and him who sits on it and those around it. Then chapter 5 continues that same description of that throne. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and of the, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right of him, hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings, and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing." Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And then you have the opening of the seals of that book by the Lamb. May God bless our reading of his word. That activity of Jesus is an activity that he did at his, after his ascension. And now that's what, of what we have as the 
part of the biblical basis for the instruction that's given us in Lord's Day 19. In Lord's Day 19. Concerning the last articles that deal with Jesus, the Apostles' Creed has 12 articles. Several of them deal with Jesus. And now this concludes the treatment of Jesus. Why is it added, and sitteth at the right hand of God? Because Christ is ascended into heaven for this end, that he might appear as head of his church, by whom the Father governs all things. What profit is this glory of Christ our head unto us? First, that by his Holy Spirit he pours out heavenly graces upon us, his members. And, two, then that by his power he defends and preserves us against all enemies. What comfort is it to thee that Christ shall come again to judge the quick and the dead? That in all my sorrows and persecutions, with uplifted head, I look for the very same person who before offered himself for my sake to the tribunal of God and has removed all curse from me. I look for that very same person to come as judge from heaven, who shall cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation, but shall translate me with all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joys and glory. <coughs> Remember that the Catechism's treatment of the, Ten Com of the Apostles' Creed is with this question, what is necessary for a Christian to believe? What is necessary for a Christian to believe? The answer the Catechism gives in 22 is, all things promised us in the Gospel which the articles of our Catholic undoubted Christian faith briefly teach us. So when we treat this, is just like we treat all the other articles, we're looking at it from the perspective of what is necessary for a Christian to believe. There are details given in the scriptures that are unnecessary to believe to be saved, but there are other details that must be. This falls into the realm of those which are essential to faith and salvation. We must believe that the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world is going to come again. He came once, he made his first appearance, he's coming now, he's going to make his second appearance. And that'll be what we call his second coming, his second appearance. And his purpose in coming is to judge. But right now, it's vital that we know that he sits enthroned at the right hand of God. We want to consider these two things. We believe. What is it that we believe he sits at the right hand of God? And then secondly, what do we believe, what does it mean when we say, and he's coming again to judge? He sits enthroned at the right hand of God. When at his resurrection, his human nature, body and soul, human, like us in all things, when his human nature was changed, not lost, but when it went from humble to exalted, from earthly to heavenly, at his resurrection, he stayed in the realm of the earthly for 40 days. 
at his ascension that already heavenly, exalted, glorified human nature found its home, if you will, in heaven, but in the specific position of being at the right hand of God. The right hand of a throne was a position which often executed the authority and the power of the throne. Just as Joseph, that's the best example that we have, sat at the right hand of Pharaoh. Pharaoh had all the authority, but the power and authority of the king, of the Pharaoh, was exercised through Joseph. So he carried the seal ring of Pharaoh, and whatever he said and did, all the people of the Egypt had to recognize was with the authority of the Pharaoh. He represented the Pharaoh, the king. The right hand man is as the right hand of power of the king. Jesus is given that position. So when he was ascending up into heaven, then he began the Great Commission by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth is given unto me. All authority, all power is the King James, but all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse uh, 15, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15, we read this set of him. Sorry, can't find it yet. Yes, 15. What is, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. Word for power who is the, only, the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. That's worthy of an amen. That's the position that becomes and belongs to Jesus at God's right hand. Now we read that he, Jesus, sits on that right hand. When a lawyer in a court presents his case and he's finished with it, he sits. The sitting at the right hand of God indicates that Jesus has completed a, a portion of his work because he's going to continue to exercise that authority at the right hand of God. He's got more to do. But there's a huge portion of his work, of his redemptive work, that's accomplished, that's completed. So that work which he did on earth as our Savior is now finished. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus is called the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, which he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Same thing is found in Hebrews 10, verse 12. In that position, at the right hand of God, Jesus, on behalf of God, carries out God's plan. That's the whole point of Revelation 5. God's got a plan. It's written in this book, this scroll, that's sealed with six seals on the end of that rolled scroll, written on both sides of the roll. But it's sealed. 
No man is found who can take the book from the hand of him who sits on the throne and break the seals and carry out the plan until the elder comes to John and says, don't weep, there is no man, you're right, but there is, and then listen to the description. He doesn't say Jesus, he doesn't say Christ, he's described as one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, king, king. Sits on the throne of the most powerful kingdom of Israel. Rule over all his great empire. He's the lion of Judah's tribe and the root of David. And then you, you get with that picture, this additional thought. He's a lamb. A lamb that had been killed, sacrificed. So the picture is that the lamb is there and you can see visibly that he has been sacrificed. So however that's going to be portrayed, that's the two things. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb that as it had been slain. He takes the book and he has the authority and the power to break those seals off the end of that rolled scroll and enable it to open up. And thus the plan of God made before the foundation of the world can be uh, developed and take place as it were the Lamb reads that and implements it. So Jesus, doing, finishing his redemptive work on earth, now sits at the right hand of God and he completes with all authority the work that he had initially accomplished. He carries out the fruits of it. He does that one. He earns salvation. Just as he brought his blood to heaven and the souls that God had, God above time, says rightly they belong in heaven, he brought the evidence that they were saved. So the accuser of them had to be cast out of heaven. But what about us who are born after his ascension? Well, that blood that Jesus took to heaven is there as proof to the Father that we're the ones who are worthy to be blessed. We're saved in that shed blood. And in that position, he completes his work by applying all the blessings of salvation that he earned for us. And he does that through the, if you will, the pipeline of the Holy Spirit. The Lord willing, next week, Lord's Day 20, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But Jesus does that at that right hand of God. And he uses everything that takes place in the history of the world. It's all in that plan, all in that book. He uses all of it for the service of and for the sake of his work of saving a people so that everything that happens in all of the world, naturally, physically, calamities, fires, earthquakes, tsunamis, everything in the economy, everything is worked for the service of that redeemed people, for the bride of the bridegroom. He accomplishes his purpose for his church in everything that happens. And then 1 Corinthians 15 says, when he's finished that work and all things are under his feet, then he bows before the one on the throne, that God may be all in all. So his purpose is to carry out God's plan. It's all about God. But because God has adopted unto himself a people that are his children, through Jesus, Jesus' redemptive work and now sovereign potentate, Lord of lords and King of kings, 
His work is for the sake of those people, those children of God, God's glory and the salvation of God's people. That rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords is universal. His kingship at the right hand of God is not limited in any degree or to any extent. Everything, everything that happens, the fly, the butterfly, the grass, the leaves that grow and fall and rot and decompose, those little bugs that all of a sudden come flying around in our houses at this time of the year, everything, all under his control in a twofold way. One, by his spirit and grace, he rules over his church. By his spirit and grace, he rules over his church. And his rule isn't only in everything, but the amazing nature of that rule especially is seen when he takes a heart of, of stone and he makes us willing in the day of his power. Psalm 110. He makes us willing in the day of his power. He works in us to want to, to will, and to do his good pleasure. He gathers, he gathers an infant. Some infants before they're even born. And he saves them unto himself. And he gathers them into his bosom. He gathers others through the realm of the church as they're instructed by their parents. And he uses that weak and confused instruction because it's always accompanied with sin to accomplish his purpose to save unto himself a people. He causes that word to go forth in the mission fields. And in the lives of God's people, he works an example before others that makes them raise questions. How can you endure such difficulty with such calm and peace? And we give an example, a witness to the truth of his work, and he uses that to gather unto himself those people whose names are written in that book of life. He defends. So precious is that church. So precious are the members of his body that he defends them. Defends them, the catechism says, against all their enemies. And he counts his enemies as their enemies and their enemies as his enemies. And he preserves in the prayer this morning. As amazing as the work of taking a heart of stone and making it to be a heart of flesh, as amazing as the work of redeeming us and justifying us, is that work of keeping us in the faith. It's easier for Mark to drive his powerful horses that he's trained to cooperate than it is for the Spirit to keep us in salvation. <clears throat> when we're willing, it's because he makes us willing. He did the work. So that we live yet with this body of death so that our best works are bloody rags. 
And yet there's a beginning of new obedience. So there's a work, a constant work that he performs in preserving unto himself that people in Jesus Christ. So, one way he sits in that, rules in that universal way is that by his spirit and grace he rules over his church. But the second way is he rules by his power over all of the ungodly and the devil and all his host. He makes us willing, they remain unwilling. But in spite of their unwillingness, he still uses them. Not once in a while, but constantly, continuously, he uses them. And then we are able to know that all the opposition and all persecution is under his direction. It's fulfilling a purpose that the Father has. It's merely carrying out that which is written in the scroll, in the book, and it's accomplishing a purpose to save his people. Maybe not as obvious as the cross, but equally an instrument in the hand of our King, our Lord of Lords, to accomplish the salvation and the formation of his people into the image of his Son. So all of creation is an instrument. And, and sometimes the best examples are found in the book of Joshua. He stopped the sun in order to accomplish his purpose. He sent locusts. He caused hornets to confound one of their enemies in an army. He made the east wind to blow and the Red Sea dried up. The economy, every flu bug, every cold, every cancer, all he uses. And that is why we can walk through this desert land, through the valley, assured. When we walk through that valley, the Lord is still my shepherd. I shall not want. No matter what happens, the shepherd is right there. He's fulfilling his father's will. He's carrying out. There's no mistake. There's nothing that happens that he doesn't will to happen. Every circumstance, every situation is his work to save us and to conform us to the, his image. We don't have to fight in order to gain a victory. We have to fight sin. But we don't fight in order to gain a victory. We fight as those who are already more than, not just a victor, we're more than a conqueror. And it's the knowledge of his position and his use of all things that gives us a solid comfort as he uses us and moves us to obey him, to confess him, to be conscious of his gracious providence so that we can, even in tears, sing and rejoice. All is well with my soul. Now, secondly, he will make a second appearance. Right now, we cannot see him. He's at the right hand of God in glory. We're here. But he will appear again. And that appearance won't be with anything more than what he already has. 
It'll be an appearance with such majesty, such glory, with ten thousands of his angels, so that when he comes, he comes as, well, Matthew 24. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Great power and glory. Same thing in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. But he comes, now notice this, then shall appear the sign, notice, not of Jesus, not of Christ, of the Son of Man. And then again, and they shall see the Son of Man coming. That name, Son of Man, Be careful with it. Son of God, very obviously he's divine. We automatically want to think son of man means human. Yes, but so much more, so much more. John 5, verse 22. The Father judgeth no man. He hath committed judgment unto the Son. Jesus is the judge. Verse 29. I'm sorry. Verse 27 of John 5. Hath given him authority to execute judgment also. Listen to the reason. God has given to him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Daniel 7 is the first time that expression, Son of Man, appears. And here, and in Matthew 24, the reason why that name is given to him is because he is the judge. There's something about that name. We, in the United States, make a lot of our judicial system because we say with juries, we're judged by our peers. There's something very fair about that. That Jesus judges is because he came into our flesh and blood. He is like us in all things. And that's in addition to his deity, perfectly equips him to be a perfect judge. He knows what it's like to live in every situation of life and do it right. And then he knows how wrong it is to violate that which is right. So he's given authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. And that's whom Matthew 24 says we shall see make his appearance. He didn't look like that authority when he came in our human nature, humbled. But in that human nature, exalted, he comes to judge. And so even our confession of faith, we don't just simply say, he sits on the right hand of God and he's going to come again. No, we say, he's going to come again to judge. Judgment of all on the earth and of all things on the earth is essential to his appearance. That appearance will be personal and it will be literal. As you saw him go up, so shall he come again. That's the way disciples knew him as the person of their master, their savior. But now, with a heavenly glory and a majesty. It'll be the event that marks the end 
of the scroll. All of the plan of God with regard to this dispensation. Now we may understand that whatever happens in the new heavens and the new earth is also a part of a plan of God. But this is the plan, the scroll, the book of this dispensation. And it ends with the literal appearance of Jesus with power and with great glory. It'll be an appearance. And, and we use that word, maybe we should use the word revelation. It'll be an unveiling. It'll be an uncovering. He has it, but now there's a veil. We can't see it. Just like the veil in the temple. You couldn't see what was behind it. So there's a veil, but the revelation is the veil is open and we'll see all of that glory that belongs to him already. He will present him. It will evidence him as redeemer and as judge. And we might not know the day or the hour, but we don't have to worry about the fact that we might be surprised because we won't be. The signs of the times are given to us. We work together as a body. We will not be surprised by his appearance. The ungodly will be caught as a thief in the night, but they're children of the night. We're children of the day. We know. He comes to judge. That ought not be a surprise. Listen to how many Psalms speak of that. And you start with the very first one. That's why we selected that one. There's the judgment day in which the wicked shall not stand. But listen to Psalm 96, verse 13. He cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Psalm 98, last verse. He cometh to judge the earth with righteousness shall he judge the world and people with equity. The Psalms already knew of that judgment that would take place. They didn't know who the judge was going to be, well, except that it would be God, but that God in Christ is going to be the judge. The purpose of the judgment is what's called the theodicy. I know that I've said from the pulpit, although I remember saying it in the other auditorium, that's a word we all have to know, theodicy. T-H-E-O, God, the Greek word for God. And then dice, D-I-C-Y, dictus. God is righteous, God is just. The purpose of the judgment is the theodicy. God will show in the judgment day that everything that he did is right, is right. God is good. Recently had a conversation with some who sadly are taught only that God is love and that when bad things happen to God's people, it can't be the work of a God of love. When the emphasis of one's convictions and belief is on God being love, as wonderful and marvelous as that is, that's not where the emphasis of the scriptures place the emphasis. Scripture places the emphasis on God is God, or God is good. God is the highest good. That's why God loves himself. That's why God has to love himself. 
That's why he does love himself. He is good, so perfectly good. He's worthy of love, his own and ours. Worthy of his love. When his goodness is violated, that sin. He must and does respond. That's what we call his holiness. Because he is good, anything that violates it, well, holiness is that God is devoted and dedicated to himself as the highest good. Anything that violates his goodness is a sin. That's why it's sin. It wouldn't be sin if it didn't violate him. That's what makes something to be a sin. And he must respond. Hence, hell. Hence, the wages of sin. Death. The anger of God. That's what death is. The anger of God against those who violently violate his person. His goodness. And so God will show that he is perfectly just in sending the wicked to everlasting torment. Their sins have earned them that right. And God will show them and everyone else that this is what they deserve. God is good. Starts there. Second. What about us? The judgment day will show that all of the violent violations of that goodness of God that we commit, God, in his perfect wisdom, took and laid on his son. And his son covered all of them. And so when the books are opened and it reveals the sins of the ungodly, hell, wrath, forever. What about us? We will learn just how much value there is in the work and the blood of Jesus. There's moments when we stand amazed that God would cover and that what Jesus did is that he, he poured the punishment. But we say that so quickly and we say it, and it's right, it's right to say, but the meaning, the depth of the significance of Christ bearing the punishment, the wrath of God for our sin, it, 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 you can't put it in words, it escapes us. And yet it's so real. So the purpose of the judgment day is that we will find out how horrible sin is when we look and read what he covered. So if you will, not, not to make us ashamed, not to make us embarrassed, we're already in our glorified bodies and souls, but to teach us Every sin will be listed. Every sin of neglect. Every purposeful sin. Every kind of sin. And we're going to hear the judge himself say, I covered. I took it away. I bore it. I suffered for that. Over and over and over and over. And as we hear and stand amazed at the wonder of the suffering of the Savior, the Lamb that was slain for me, over and over again, we're going to see that. And the purpose of the judgment day 
is to amaze us so that we'll have in the tank of amazement all the fuel, all the energy we need to thank and praise him forever. What a death. What a lamb. What a savior. Again, I can say it. You can think it. We don't get it. Yeah, we do, but we don't see it all. We cannot comprehend it. We scratch the surface. And we're going to see what a Savior. That second. That's the purpose of the judgment day. And the third is God will show to our amazement why everything and anything that happened, every flake of snow that fell, all the cold and the heat, all is just perfectly right. He will answer in that explanation of why he did everything right, every why we ask. He will show that his government was just and perfect and wise. And we will say, his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Let the wicked, and that's not the ungodly, that's the church, let the wicked forsake his, his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. We're going to say, yep, yeah, that's right. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust him. His return is called in the Belgic Confession, Article 37, most desirable and comfortable. It's not something to be afraid of. It is something most wonderful. Then we're going to have perfect deliverance from the body of this death. Then our sinfulness will be gone. And then we will sin absolutely no more. Then we will, by his grace, inherit the kingdom that is being prepared for us. Then, then all of his and our enemies will receive their just judgment. Two quick thoughts. One, are my enemies his? Or better yet, are his enemies mine? They better be the same. But we may know that when, secondly, it seems that so many sinners get away with sin. So many even prison sentences are so light so that there's repeated crimes when they're released. That God will then show us that what they did on earth is this, Romans 2, when it seemed like they got away with it, he says, no, they're just treasuring themselves up wrath against the day of wrath. They're, it's being put in a bank. God's bank, God's memory, and it's earning interest so that when it compounds and it's give, executed upon them, they will receive just and due reward for all the sins that they commit. So many Psalms emphasize and speak of God's judgment because then in that Old Testamentational history, there was so much misunderstanding about what was happening. So the knowledge, God's gonna set it right, was something that they needed so desperately. We do too, we do too. That's why God constantly says, don't take vengeance. You don't have to do it. No eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You don't have to do it. I will, I will. 
Even the Lord Jesus, 1 Peter 2, did it. Even Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He did it by committing to him who judges righteously. He says he will take care of it. And the knowledge of that future judgment enabled Christ to forbear, enabled him to endure wrongs that were done to him. And he is our example that we should follow in his steps. Again, 1 Peter 2. And then we will receive the language of the Kelsey Confession, the fruits of all of our labor and sorrow. Then our perfect righteousness will be made known in Christ. And then we will receive a reward of grace. Then Jesus will stand before the Father and say, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. His name is written in my soul. I carried it. They're identified with me since election. They were with me in the cross. They were with me in the resurrection. They're justified. And we will hear it. God declared it long ago. It's in God's mind forever, eternally. But we will hear it then with a clarity that we cannot get now. To know, to believe, to be assured. He's sitting there. He's executing judgment. He's executing the plan of God is something that we most often have to remind ourselves in our troubles and sorrows. The Catechism says that, in my sorrows and persecutions, that's what makes us look up, more often than not. So now we're sitting here in the calm of a Sunday morning. Good, good to know. But when it really hits us, is when we're hurting. When it seems things are not right. When we don't understand why, Lord, then we're, we're told this is a part of our faith that we have to trust to be what the Bible says will happen. So the child of God always lives in hope. He always knows there's hope. There's more to come. We can't see it, but it will. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, but it'll come. Bible study this week. Before the flood, God said, Every imagination of the thought of man's heart is only evil continually. My spirit will not always strive. I'm not going to set the word before them anymore. And yet, there's a man named Noah. You know what Noah means? Rest, comfort, hope. Things got darker and darker, and there stood Noah, preacher of righteousness. There's hope. We can have comfort as we walk through the valley. God never explained to Job why. Not one word of explanation to Job. God just asked him all kinds of questions that made Job realize he didn't know. And he didn't have the right to judge God. That's where we stand. But there's hope. His promise is sure. Jesus sits at God's right hand, and he will come again. Think of that tonight when we recite it. Amen. Bless this word to us, Father. Help us to this incident through these events this morning to take this truth of thy word and hold it dear and precious.
and believe it to be a source of comfort and a reason for us to trust and still obey. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.